Okay, Revelation chapter 10. Last week we spent our whole time in the tribulation. You may have left her a little depressed. We're going to go back to the tribulation, but by the end we're going to pull out of it. (laughs) So get me out of the tribulation, right? But it is important that we study what God's Word says about this event, even if there are differences relative to when it happens. Um, And let me just remind you, this is week five. Uh, Oasis ends October 25. No, not October 25, September 25. Sorry. And then we begin our Bible studies. Okay, so whatever that first Wednesday is, is in October. Second, thank you. And that's ladies' Bible study, men's Bible study, co-ed Bible study. And I would encourage you to just transfer to one of those. There's some great things. I just want to make that announcement. Um, So let's let's put the chart back on the screen. So whether you are an all-millennialist or a pre-millennialist, there will be a tribulation. It, it It is coming in the future. We're not sure about the timing, And someone told me they're a pan-millennialist. You know what that is, right? Yeah, it's all going to pan out in the end. So, whichever view you take, there will be a tribulation. And so we need to study it. We need to understand it. Um, With humility, I've said my approach is a premillennial, pre-tribulation view. That's the, the grid through which I'm going to look at the end times. Pre-millennial, the church will be snatched up. Uh, pre-millennial and pre-trib, the church will be snatched up before the tribulation, and Jesus will come back before a literal one thousand year reign of Christ on the earth. We looked at First Thessalonians chapter four, that great verse: "The Lord Himself, right, will descend with the cry of a command, with the voice of an archangel, and the." Uh, And the dead in Christ will rise first, and we who are alive will be joined with them and meet the Lord in the air. Beautiful passage. The church then goes to be with the Lord. And then there is worship for the church, and we talked about the judgment seat of Christ, where believers will appear before the Lord. And this is not a judgment of the believer's sin, but a judgment of the believer's works. We've started the tribulation in Revelation chapter 6. It begins, the six seals are opened by the Lamb. And as each seal is open, riders come out. The first on a white horse, but this is not Christ. This is someone associated with the Antichrist. Uh, There is then a red horse, a black horse, and a pale horse, all in chapter 6. Then the fifth seal, remember, is the... The souls of those who have been slain for the testimony of the word of God, and they are under the altar. The sixth seal, then, is a violent, massive earthquake. Chapter 7, there is 144,000 people from the tribes of Israel mentioned. I believe they are Jewish evangelists, Jewish people who have come to trust in Christ And what are they going to do during the tribulation? They're going to witness for Christ. Uh, There is coming a day that will be a massive movement of salvation at, listen, at the most unexpected time. That's what I love about it. That's how God works, isn't it? Just when Satan thought through the suffering and the crucifixion of Christ, he had won God took the most unlikely of circumstances and brought great victory three days after the crucifixion. So when Satan is at work creating a tribulation, God is at work saving people. The seventh seal then consists of seven angels with seven what? Trumpets. Trumpets. As each trumpet blows, this is all in chapter 8, There is more tribulation. Six 
trumpets are revealed, and there's the pouring out of God's wrath. Chapter 9. At the end of chapter 9, there's one more trumpet. So six trumpets have blown, but there is one more trumpet in chapter 9. Look in chapter 9 um, at the final verses, beginning in verse 20. Chapter 9, verse 20. You can see in verse 13, the sixth angel blows his trumpet. And then in verse 20, the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, nor give up worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, which cannot see or hear or walk, nor did they repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. So we're told then that the people left do not repent. The Lord has poured out judgment on the world, but they do not repent. Now chapter 10, chapter 10, look in verse 1, chapter 10, verse 1. Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud with a rainbow over his head, and his face was like the sun and his legs like pillars of fire. John then sees in this vision... An angel coming down, descending to the earth. And the angel stands with one foot on the earth and one foot on the sea in verse uh, 2. He had a little scroll open in his hand and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. So he is demonstrating that while Satan has temporary, temporary reign over the earth... It is all under the authority of God, right? And dominion still belongs to the Lord. The angel carries the scroll that Christ opened in chapter, two, chapter 10, verse 10. John hears the mighty roar of a lion followed by seven peals of thunder down in verse 3. As John prepares to write down what he heard in the thunder, he is warned by a voice from heaven in verse 4 to do what? Keep it secret. Since thunder is often used to to depict God's fury, it is safe to assume the message that John hears is one of further judgment and it is too terrifying to reveal. That same voice from heaven tells John then to eat the scroll. Now look in chapter 11. Chapter 11. I'm trying to pull it all together tonight for you. Chapter 11, the two witnesses. And this is where we left off last time. Now before the seventh trumpet sounds, and that will sound in verse 15. But before the seventh trumpet sounds, there's another glimpse in the midst of the, of the terror and the judgment of God's grace. His marvelous grace. We meet in chapter 11 two of maybe some of the greatest characters in all of Scripture, and we don't even know their names. Now, some people believe it's Moses and Elijah, and maybe I'll show you in, in a moment. But John begins to describe these two characters in chapter 11. First of all, he says the world hates them. The world hates them. Their message of repentance doesn't fit into a rebellious, enlightened world that has already ignored the judgments and the warnings from God. We also know that God protects them for a time from the hostility of the world. Look in verse 5. If anyone wants to harm them, fire flows out of their mouth and devours their enemies. The Lord unleashes these two witnesses, to preach the gospel to a world, to a hostile world for 42 months. Okay, And look in verse 3, chapter 11, verse 3. And I will grant authority to my two witnesses and they will prophesy for 1,260 days. How long is that? Three and a half years. Three and a half years. And he guarantees their safety throughout this time. And they, they can control the weather. They can, they can turn water to blood. So you begin to thank Moses. They strike the earth with any plague they see fit. So no, no wonder the unrepentant world hates them. 
Once their ministry is complete, in verse 7, the beast comes up out of the pit and kills them. Now, John says the people don't even bury them. They leave their bodies in the streets for three and a half days. Now, I want you to to see verses 1 through 8. This occurs in Jerusalem. It's very clear, very clear. It occurs in Jerusalem. The eyes of the world are on these two dead bodies celebrating their demise. And then what happens to the two witnesses? They, they, they lie dead in the streets, but they are raised from the dead. When you begin to read all this, um, verse 11, chapter 11, verse 11. But after the three and a half days, a breath of life from God entered them, and they stood up on their feet, and great fear, I bet it did, fell on those who saw them. And let's just read it for a minute. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud and their enemies watched them. And at that hour, there was a great earthquake and a tenth of the city fell. 7,000 people were killed on the earthquake and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. That is chapter 11. Now chapter 11 beginning in verse 15 has a final victorious statement. The seventh trumpet blows, see verse 15, and let's just read it for a moment. And there were loud voices in heaven saying, what did they say? The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sit on the thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God. And then they go on to this beautiful song. Now chapter 12. Chapter 12. Here you have the woman and the child and what? The dragon. The woman, the child, and the dragon. Now as we look at that in, we'll just read Verses 1 through 3. And a great sign, chapter 12, and a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon. And if you skip down to verse 5, she gave birth to a male child. So let's look, we have a woman, we've got a child, and we have a dragon. Who do you think the dragon is? Satan, Uh, pretty simple. The son, uh, the, the child is Christ. The question is, who is the woman? Who does she symbolize? There are really two views. One view says it's Israel. And the other view says it is Israel and the Messianic community. And we'll see in a moment, I think it does include all of them, but those are the two views on that. Look in verse 7 now. Look in verse 7. Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the, how else does he describe Satan? Deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. While Satan and his demons were cast out of heaven after their first rebellion, they still have access to it. Job chapter 1, verse 6, chapter 2, verse 1. But in this war, in Revelation 12... God's angels overcome the forces of Satan and cast them out of heaven down to the earth. At this point, the earth will be overrun with demonic forces. And the rest of chapter 12 describes how these demonic forces and demons pursue and persecute Israel and the rest of her children. Verse um, 17. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of 
the sea. The woman, the child, and the dragon. Now the Antichrist. The Antichrist. Chapter 13. Chapter 13. John introduces us to another key figure in the event in the end times. It is the Antichrist. John uses vivid language. He calls him a beast. He is an influential world political leader who rises to power in the back half of this seven-year tribulation period. He wages aggressive war against the people of God on earth. Now John says the Antichrist is supported by an evil companion who is a false prophet. See, you have a religious leader and you have a political leader. And they perform demonically powered signs and wonders that leads credibility to the Antichrist. Now, as we've already noted, at this point in the tribulation, the world is overrun with demons, demonic influence, de- demonic powers infest every area of life. Okay. Look down in chapter 13, verse 18. Chapter 13, verse 18. He uses a number. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. There are a million interpretations on this a million and we don't have enough time there is something called gematria have you heard of that when they affix um, uh, uh, symbols to the numbers in Greek and Hebrew and then they add them up and and, and come up with symbols and maybe I'm not saying no I I think it's a little more simpler than that Um, I think it's a little more simpler it is significant that it represents man Okay, seven is God's what? Perfect number, right? Seven is God's perfect number. And man, who was created on what day? Six day. Six day. Seven is God's perfect number. Man, created in the sixth day, always falls short of God's perfection. Always. So the number itself maybe doesn't necessarily sum unlock some greater, deeper spiritual truth, although it may, it is representative of man and his inability to, un, to uh, achieve perfection. Maybe that's what this number 666 means. Let's go on. Chapter 14 now, the wine press of God's wrath. Chapter 14. Another preview of God's ultimate victory. Look in chapter 14, verse 3. And they, referring to the 144,000, right, these witnesses, these evangelists from the 12 tribes of Israel, verse 3, and they were singing a new song before the throne and before the, living, the four living creatures and before the elders. No one could learn that song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. God seals them. He protects them. This is the army of witnesses. What happens then in chapter 14? Look in verse 6. We have some angels. Verse 6. Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim. So once again, God is proclaiming the gospel through 144,000, through two witnesses, now through these angels. Look over in verse 15. And another angel came out of the temple calling with a loud voice. Look in verse 17. Then another angel came out. So there are these angels involved. Look, though, in verse 14. This is beautiful. Verse 14. Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud. And seated on the cloud, one like a son of man, with a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle. In his hand. And that is Jesus. Jesus. The wine press, though, look in verse 20 now. Verse 20. And the wine press was trodden outside the city, and blood flowed from the wine press as high as a horse's bridle. John graphically describes the severity of this battle that will take place outside of Jerusalem. Enough blood will be spilled to cover the entire nation five feet deep. Now the bowls, look in chapter 15. John then, in chapter 15, returns to heaven. A scene in heaven. 
Okay? The Antichrist sings songs. I mean, they, they're singing songs against the Antichrist, redemptive, speaking of the redemptive work of the Lord. Look in chapter 15, chapter 15 verse 3. And they sing the songs of Moses. The servant of God and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. And you read the rest of it. It's just beautiful. It's chapter 15. Chapter 16. Chapter 16. The seven bowls of God's wrath. Starting in verse 2. Rapid fire. Here they come. The judgment. And then finally, when we get down to the seventh bowl in chapter 16, verse 17, we're about out of the tribulation. Chapter 16, verse 17, the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne saying, it is done. What does that sound like? It is finished on the cross Jesus said, I've accomplished your salvation. All you have to do is believe, and even your belief is by my grace. (laughs) It is done, he says now. God's wrath has finished. Chapter 17, John answers a question, what is the religion like during the tribulation? He gives an kind of a glimpse into the false worship of the beast, the Antichrist. This is interesting that... The church is called Jesus' what? Bride, right? Bride. In chapter 17, verse 15, the false religion of the Antichrist is referred to as a harlot. As a harlot. Chapter 18. Chapter 18, the fall of Babylon. After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was made bright with his glory. And he called out with a mighty voice, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. Babylon. What do we know about Babylon? We know that's who conquered the southern kingdom Judah. Right? There was the monarchy, the three kings. Who were they? First king was... Saul, and then David, and then Solomon. Then Israel split into two kingdoms, right? The northern kingdom was called Israel. The southern kingdom was called Judah. The northern kingdom fell in 722 to the Assyrians. The southern kingdom fell in 586 to the Babylonians. We go all the way back to Genesis 11. Where was the Tower of Babel? It says in there it was in the area of Shinar. And there are some who believe that was in Babylon. Babylon then, throughout the scripture, is, 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 is uh, juxtaposed uh, beside the goodness of God. And they are seen as the enemies of God, Babylon. And here, fallen, fallen, is Babylon the Great. Potentially, all the enemies of God now, they are, they are beginning to fall, he's saying. And then chapter 19, chapter 19, we made it. We made it. After this, verse 1, after this I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out, Hallelujah. And we'll look at this next week, but look there's a marriage supper of the Lamb. That's, that's the best covered dish supper you've ever been to in your life. And then verse 11. Then I saw heaven opened. And behold, a white horse. And the one sitting on it is called Faithful and True. Here's our king. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God, John chapter 1. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on on white horses. So see, see the progression. See the progression. 
the church is snatched up. I believe the rapture occurs. Seven years of tribulation. And then the coming of Christ, Revelation 19. We'll look at that next week, and we'll begin to look at what happens through the great white throne judgment and the millennial kingdom. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you that we can study your word. We are humble when we approach this. As I've said many times, there are Jesus-loving, God-honoring, Bible-believing people who have honest differences on this. But there are some... There are some fixed truths that Jesus is coming back, that we will be with him, that there is a tribulation coming. And Lord, that you will reign forever and ever, and we will be with you. And we long for that day. So we say, come, Lord Jesus, come. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you.